I know, I know, yet another video about Turbonique, the 1960s manufacturer of rocket-powered turbine drag racing equipment that's been the darling of the internet for years. Hey, this isn't even my first foray into the topic, but this is by far my most interesting. This exploration isn't into the weird, wild, and wacky history of Turbonique itself, but rather one specific car that used the rocket drag axle in a way no other vehicle did and has since been lost to history. Before we talk about the specific car that this video is crafted around, we need to clarify a couple of things about Turbonique that are lost in most of all the reporting on the history of the short-lived and wild company. For starters, the stuff, as insane as it was, worked. It worked not just sometimes, but it worked with very few incidents, very few problems, and in some cases for years and years without parts breakage or failure. It's often said that Turbonique drag axles were bombs that failed regularly and hurt people, maimed people, or even worse. And that, in fact, is patently false. The only known failures of these things were when people did the one thing they were explicitly told would cause the machines to explode. More on that in a minute. My own opinions on Turbonique have changed over the years, and as insane as it is to say, at this point, I believe Gene Middlebrooks, who ended up in prison for mail fraud, ending the company's existence, was the victim of something that destroys a lot of small businesses, a lack of cash flow and the inability to scale up. See, Middlebrooks was jailed for mail fraud because by the end, he was sending people units that were partially machined and not assembled and truly not what anybody figured that they were ordering when they sent him the money. The only reason someone does this is because they're so far behind in production they can no longer keep up, and they're desperate to grab any money they can from the customers. Basically, the business failed because Middlebrooks couldn't keep feeding the cash monster, and he wrote it to the end knowing he had a winner, but unwilling to accept that he himself couldn't get the thing to the promised land. So what made me consider many elements of the failure of Turbanique? Most significantly is the fact that the product worked and was proven to work in front of crowds across America. Secondly is that Middlebrooks had an incredible fleet of cars, motorcycles, and at least one unlimited snowmobile using these units, and I believe they were all paying customers. What was that lineup? Well, the vehicles included, but were not limited to, Larry Grant and Jack Hamilton's motorcycle, which used a small Turbidec unit, rated at 360 horsepower, but run at about half of that, and was able to run low 10s in the 1960s. The famed Black Widow Volkswagen that wrecked at some 180 miles an hour and regularly matched race against fuel dragsters. The Boss Cat Unlimited Snowmobile, which was capable of running more than 125 miles an hour in an era when this was seen as utterly impossible. Joe Mazza from New England Dragway built a dragster with a Turbonique unit in it. Mazza was actually the guy that ran the concession stands at the racetrack, and he ran this car for years. The 185-mile-an-hour Lightning Bug was a second Volkswagen, and that raced for several seasons without an incident and was a major match race attraction. The beautiful Wayne Knuth Odyssey Dragster, well-known at places like Great Lakes Dragaway and others in the middle of the country. Knuth will go on to a long career in jet cars. The Ozark Mule Mustang was a mainstay of the AHRA Tour in the back half of the 1960s. The Pegasus Mustang Fastback was one of the most well-known and photographed of the Turbonique fleet. Captain Jack McClure drove the Sizzler, a real Z16 Chevelle which still had the 396 on the nose and had a rocket drag axle on the back. He wrecked in huge fashion destroying the car when an axle failed one night. The Studnicker brothers fielded this Turbonique-powered 1969 Camaro funny car known as One Step Ahead in 1970. The Turbonique Dart was a frequent match racer before it met its end in a high-speed wreck, which the driver walked away from. The Turbo Stang of Jim Castillo was a stalwart performer using the 850-horsepower rated 130-pound version of the rocket axle. The incredible U.S. Turbine 1 Dragster, built by Frank Hooser at Race Car Specialties, bodied by Doug Cruz, funded by rich guy Fling Taylor, and most successfully driven by George the Stone Age Man Hutchison, was unbelievable. It could and regularly did run 200 miles an hour in the quarter mile and was a great match racer with some of the top piston-powered cars, specifically dragsters, of its era. Oh yes, and the subject of this particular story, Hassler's Hustler. An altered run by a family in Ohio, which had the turbine mounted in the front, backwards, and powered by the rear axle with a drive shaft as a traditional engine would run. Seriously? Yeah, here's the proof. They're the only ones that tried it, and it's become an obsession of mine to learn more about this car. But before we do that, one last detour before we get to Hassler's Hustler. As you can already tell, most of the people, in fact, every other person who ever had a Turbonique rocket drag axle had it mounted at the rear of the car. It was the most compact and best package way to do it. 
Also, it was a tidy location in the event of a rare explosion. Explosion, you say? Yeah, it did happen, but so rarely. How? By defying the only rule of operating a Turbidique rocket drag axle. Once it was on, it was on. And once it was off, it was off. Hitting the fire button a second time resulted in this. This is the Boss Cat snowmobile being reduced to a pile of parts. A few people got nicked, some people's cars got damaged, but everybody left that day on the snow and ice in one piece. This is a bad day for the driver of the Boss Cat, but in relation to Hassler's Hustler and the potential it had for a mistake being made and what could happen in that event, it's child's play. Imagine this happening in front of the driver. So how did this explosion happen? To understand that, we need to know how the rocket drag axle worked to really get the idea of the root of this explosion. The Turbonique ran on a fuel called propyl nitrate and pure oxygen. The oxygen was there to help burn the volume of propyl nitrate the motor needed to consume to make the advertised power. A pair of spark plugs would be fired to get the party started and to keep it lit. The oxygen and propyl nitrate would enter the combustion chamber at 300 PSI, and once the igniter button was pressed, the action started immediately, spinning the turbine up to 62,000 RPM instantly. The pressure in the combustion chamber would overcome the gases being injected while the spark plugs fired and then relieve enough for more to be allowed in between firing. This was all happening in tiny fractions of seconds, but the engine was basically pressure regulated by what was happening in the combustion chamber. One of the most common mistakes people make when they talk about these is to mention a turbinique being throttled. In fact, there was no throttle. It was either working or it wasn't. In the event the driver pedaled, quote-unquote, the turbine by letting off the button and hitting it again, the fuel which accumulated in the turbine would then be ignited, and rather than a controlled combustion event, it would be a runaway explosion that either blew the housing to pieces, oversped the impeller, or otherwise caused the unit to fail catastrophically. That is how you blew up a turbonique, and thankfully, it very rarely happened. Now, on to the Hustler. Not much is known about the Hassler family of Alliance, Ohio, prior to their foray into drag racing's wild side. Charles C.G. Hassler was a body shop operator. His son, Wade, was a 20-year-old willing driver, and it seems both of them had a bent for the experimental. Around 1967, the family bought this car, the AA altered of Akron, Ohio drag racing superstar Odie Smith. It seems they ran the car with the gasoline burning, remember, AA altered meant gasoline only, no methanol or nitromethane, Hemi for a time before they decided to make the switch to a Turbonique unit. I wasn't able to find any notable wins for the family, but safe it to say, if they had one of these cars, they were serious drag racers, and Wade was a serious driver to hang on to it. By all accounts, the Turbonique version of the Altar debuted in 1968, and the layout of the thing was unique then and forever will be in the annals of drag racing because, frankly, nobody's running a Turbonique unit anytime soon, and nobody is going to be placing it at the front of their altar. The Turbonique turbine was mounted where a 750-pound supercharged iron Hemi had been sitting before. The unit these guys chose weighed about 130 pounds and produced roughly twice the power of the gasoline-burning engine. So we're talking between 12 and 1,400 horsepower here, up to 1,500 depending on how hard they would run the Turbonique. Gone also was any sort of transmission. The Turbonique had a gear reduction unit on the back, which took the impeller speed down by about 90%. Normally on the shaft behind the impeller, the gear reducer ran straight into a quick-change-style rear end, and that was that. But in this case, the power went through a drive shaft to an Oldsmobile rear end that had a 323 gear in the back. Either end of that rear end held on to a 15-inch wide M&H slick. This was not the smoothest program to get working properly at first. See, the guys snapped axles like they were twigs until they paid for a specialty machine set from Donovan, California, which were made one off. Once they figured out the axle problem, the Altar would try to flip itself over backwards. Remember, their nose-heavy 1,600-pound car had suddenly become a nose-light 1,000-pound car. Mounting a truck battery to electrify the coils and fire the plugs, a nitrogen tank, an oxygen tank, the propyl nitrate tank, and 40 pounds of lead on the front axle fixed the wheelie problem. Then they figured out the back of the car was getting light at speed, causing tire spin, and causing the turbine to hit the automatic fuel cutoff when the output shaft reached 7,200 RPM. They worked on a kind of spoiler arrangement back then to create some downforce on the rear tires. Now, that spoiler arrangement is not shown in any of these photos, and I've never been able to find one that actually clarifies what they did. But, as we'll find out, research says that they did this. With that stuff, quote-unquote, fixed, 
The Hasslers hit the big time at the 1968 AHRA All-American Nationals at Bristol, Tennessee, where the majority of these photos you see in this video were taken. The car was entered in the T-slash-US category of AHRA drag racing. Research has determined this to mean turbine-slash-unlimited size. All turbine cars fell into this particular category of AHRA racing. Turbine cars were not allowed in any other sanctioning body's competition, outside of exhibition runs and other displays of horsepower and tire smoke. At the race, the car qualified with an astonishing 893 at 162 miles an hour. It ended up winning class at 1015, running a paltry 115 miles per hour. Clearly on the elimination runs and or likely single run, they lifted early. It is unknown if there was another entry in the class that weekend. One last question to answer is solved by the March 1969 Rotter and Superstock magazine profile on this car where many of the facts I've shared today have come from. And that simple question is, how the heck did they race it? The answer is more interesting than you may think. To quote the story, Hassler's Hustler is pushed up to the starting line and staged. Wade Hassler sits in the cockpit waiting for the last preparations to be made. First, his father opens the valve of a pressure tank on the right-hand side of the turbine, admitting nitrogen into the big center-mounted fuel tank to pressurize the 2.5-gallon propyl nitrate liquid propellant. Then, he twists the valve on a tank mounted to the left side of the turbine, admitting pure oxygen into a regulator, which will then feed it into said turbine. All systems are go. Wade flips a switch in the cockpit, and a pair of coils mounted to the firewall begins drawing juice from the 12-volt truck battery perched over the front axle. The coils buzz and send high-voltage current to the turbine's twin spark plugs. And then, he watches the cron deck. When the green light flashes, he instantly touches a button with his right toe that operates a solenoid. The solenoid opens the fuel regulator and the pressurized propyl nitrate mixed with oxygen is rammed into the turbine. The glowing spark plugs ignite the mixture and there is an explosion. The turbine begins spinning 62,000 RPMs almost instantly, transmitting 1,500 horsepower through the short drive shaft to the 323-geared old rear end. A 10-foot flame shoots into the air from the 5-inch exhaust pipe. The m and slicks burn as the car rockets towards the traps. A quarter mile from the Krondek tree, Wade hits the kill button. The turbine shuts down and the car rolls toward the return road. Back at the timing shack, Chuck Hassler picks up a time slip. It reads 892-162, a new AHRA national record for unlimited turbines, which isn't too bad for starters. End quote. There's no record available about what happened to the car in the short or long term, where else it ran, or where it ended up. Unfortunately, Wade Hassler, the driver, has passed away, and I've made efforts to reach Charles Hassler, the dad, who is on Facebook, but I've been unable to make contact. He shows his profile picture as Hassler's Hustler throwing flame out of that 5-inch exhaust pipe. The rest of the story, like so much of the Turbonique tale, it's really still left to be discovered. But right now, that's all I know. Pretty much all anybody knows about Hassler's Hustler. One of the most interesting, wildest, strangest, and most forgotten, at least until today, of the Turbonique-powered fleet. I'm Brian Loans. Thanks for watching.